In the 1850s, two people became synonymous with the street sellers of Victorian London. The first was the reporter and social historian Henry Mayhew, whose 1851 study, London Labour and the London Poor, in which he observed, documented and described in great detail the state of the working people of the Victorian metropolis, made him a titan of 19th century journalism. The second was an Irish girl by the name of Mary Ann Donovan. She was 18 years old when, for a brief period in 1859, she blazed into the public spotlight following her appearance at Mansion House Court, charged with obstructing the public footway. Mary Ann Donovan's story began here on Corn Hill, a busy city thoroughfare that was, and still is, lined by the offices of major banks, insurance companies and other financial institutions. Mary was an itinerant street trader. She sold combs on the streets of the City of London, and one day in March 1859 she set out to hawk her wares on Corn Hill. It wasn't long before she attracted the attention of a City of London police constable, who told her to move on, warning her in no uncertain terms that she must keep away from the city. According to the policeman's later testimony, she ignored his order, and when he repeated it, she threatened to smash him if he meddled with her. He told her that he must take her to the police station, whereupon she proceeded to lie down on the road and refused to move. He therefore summoned the assistance of another constable, and the two of them manhandled the girl to the station, their prisoner abusing them both in the vilest language as they went along. At the station she was charged with obstructing the roadway on Corn Hill by offering combs for sale, and was put in the cells to await her appearance before the Chief Magistrate of the City of London. On the morning of Saturday the 19th of March, the Right Honourable David Williams Wyer, Lord Mayor and Chief Magistrate of the City of London, took his place on the bench in the Justice Room in the Mansion House, the home and office of the Lord Mayor, and readied himself to preside over the cases of those who had been arrested in the City of London over the previous few days. David Williams Wyer had begun his year as Lord Mayor the previous November. He was a portly 58-year-old, and, at just over five feet tall, he held the distinction of being one of the shortest Lord Mayors in the history of the office. To quote the Congleton and Macclesfield Mercury in a biographical sketch of him, which it published on the 13th of November, 1858, The new Lord Mayor is a little fat lawyer. In his robes, he looks as ridiculous as it is possible to imagine. However, when on that Saturday morning, Mary Ann Donovan, described by the newspapers as a poorly clad but clean and good-looking Irish girl aged 18, stood before him, he was, no doubt, confident that she would be overawed by his obvious and undoubted importance. Little did he realise that he had come face to face with his nemesis. The first witness against the accused was the police officer who had arrested her. He informed the court that he had observed her obstructing the footway on Corn Hill by offering combs for sale, and he had warned her to keep away from the place in consequence of complaints made of the annoyance caused by her and other girls. He had, he testified, asked her to move on, but she had persisted in keeping up on the footway and had threatened to smash him if he meddled with her. He recounted how he and a fellow officer had carried her off to the police station and how she had abused them both in the vilest language as they went along. At this point, Mary Ann Donovan stiffened and interrupted the officer's testimony. It's all false that he says, my lord. I never caused any obstruction and never annoyed anybody. But he says you abused him shamefully and lay down in the roadway, the Right Honourable David Williams Wire responded. "'Yes, I did lie down,' retorted Mary Ann Donovan, "'for why should I go to the station to be locked up "'only for walking in the streets? "'And as for the abuse, my lord, "'that officer abuses me every time he sees me "'in language such as I dare not take upon my lips. "'And besides, he has kicked me "'so that my leg is covered with bruises, "'and if you knew all that he has said and done, "'I'm sure you would give him six months.' "'No doubt Lord Mayor Wyatt later wished "'that he had quit there and then "'whilst he was slightly ahead.' But hindsight is a valuable gift, and at the time he probably thought that a poorly clad 18-year-old Irish girl would be no match for the Lord Mayor and Chief Magistrate of the City of London, splendidly attired in all the robes and regalia of his office, no matter how ridiculous he looked in them. 
And so the Right Honourable David Williams Wyer ploughed on and proceeded to chide the prisoner before him. Well, you must not come into the city to sell your combs. That is often only a cover for immodest purposes. And besides, you are liable to a fine of forty shillings or one month's imprisonment for hawking your things in this way. Then what can a poor girl do? came the prisoner's impassioned response. Sensing that he very much had the upper hand, the Lord Mayor assumed a grave air of superiority and censured the girl further. Why, you must try to get an honest living. But then, as can often happen when one becomes overconfident about one's own infallibility and self-importance, things began to unravel for the Lord Mayor and Chief Magistrate of the City of London, as he realised, too late, that his adversary might be poor, but she was more than a match for the fat little Lord Mayor. "'Why, I do try, and you stop me,' replied the girl. I often stay about the streets all day to do so by selling my combs and only gain a few halfpence. But I suppose you think I might go upon the streets. But that I'll never do. According to the journalist who was busily taking down the exchange for a press agency, these last words were uttered vehemently and with great natural eloquence. There's no occasion for that, snapped the Lord Mayor, trying to mask his indignation at the girl's impudence. There are many means of getting an honest living. Mary Ann Donovan's response would turn an everyday court case into a cause celebre, and would, for a short time at least, transform this 18-year-old Irish street trader into a national celebrity. Then, sir, tell me how... I can't take a shop, and if I sell in the street, you say I am liable to a forty-shilling fine or a month. If I beg, you'll give me three months, perhaps, and if I steal, I don't know what will become of me. So tell me, if you can, what a poor girl can do. Infuriated by her audacity, the Right Honourable David Williams Wyre bristled, stiffened himself, puffed out his chest, and told her, at all events, you must keep out of the city, and as you have been here before, I must send you to prison for fourteen days. And so Mary Ann Donovan was removed from the dock and was taken to Holloway Prison to serve her sentence. The Lord Mayor returned to his official residence within the mansion house to line his belly, no doubt, with good capon and put all thoughts of the poorly clad but clean Irish girl out of his mind. Meanwhile, the journalist who had been taking down the cases in the Mansion House's justice room for a press agency returned to his office and filed his copy for the Monday newspapers. Unbeknownst to the unsuspecting Right Honourable David Williams Wyre, that brief Saturday morning courtroom exchange was about to turn him into a national pariah and a figure of fun. On Monday the 21st of March, the story of Mary Ann Donovan's courtroom appearance was given prominence in newspapers all over the country, and things began to get decidedly uncomfortable for the Lord Mayor as journalists, lawyers and outraged members of the public took up Mary's cause and her simple but powerful entreaty, What Can a Poor Girl Do?, had soon achieved the mid-19th century equivalent of trending. On Tuesday the 22nd of March, a reader who signed himself a working man fired off an angry missive to the London Daily News. What can a poor girl do? Sir, permit me to refer you to the case of Mary Ann Donovan, a poor Irish girl who was committed to prison for 14 days on Saturday last by the Lord Mayor for trying to sell combs in Cornhill. Can it be right in a Christian country to punish anyone for attempting to obtain an honest living, particularly a poor girl, perhaps without parents or friends, and at all events without the slightest sympathy or protection from the chief magistrate, whose privilege it was to have helped and protected her, instead of doing her the monstrous injustice of sending her to prison for no crime? Surely, sir, the free press of England will vindicate this palpable piece of oppression. The working classes look to the powerful advocacy of the press for the support of their rights and liberties, and if the case of poor Mary Ann Donovan be not taken up, then the cause of the industrious classes is hopeless from any other channel. I am, etc., a working man. March the 22nd. Over the next few days, newspapers countrywide were almost universal in their condemnation of wires having sent a young girl to prison for trying to earn an honest living on the streets of the city. According to the Lincolnshire Chronicle, the Lord Mayor had 
committed himself by committing to prison a poor Irish girl for attempting to sell combs within the sacred bounds of his jurisdiction. The delinquent displayed total absence of the sense of awe which should overwhelm a poor hawker in the presence of the great city dignitary. Unabashed by the graceful robes of the glittering gold chain or the live Lord Mayor himself, when called upon to answer the accusation of interrupting the traffic by attempting to sell combs in the city, she asked, what was a poor girl to do? The audacity of putting such a question to the Lord Mayor! The sword-bearer was astonished, the cap of maintenance was horrified, the city beadle nearly swooned. Had she never heard tell of the numberless tea-meetings and chapel anniversaries at which he had presided, nor of his having taken the chair at no end of branch Bible societies and missionary meetings? No, no, she could never have heard of half the greatness of the great wire, or she, an ill-dressed girl of eighteen, would not have dared to put such a question. She must have been ignorant, very ignorant, or she would have known that ill-dressed people have no business in the city. She had broken the city law. Poor and poorly clad, she had attempted to gain an honest living, and she had dared to ask the Lord Mayor, what was a poor girl to do? And this pious Lord Mayor replied, go to prison for fourteen days. The Illustrated Times went so far as to question the actual legality of the Lord Mayor's having sent Mary Ann Donovan to prison, pointing out that, according to the police act under which she had been prosecuted, the punishment is expressly limited to a fine not exceeding forty shillings, and imprisonment is only authorised in the event of non-payment of the fine. It does not appear that Mary Donovan was fined at all. If not, her imprisonment is utterly illegal. At the same time, we can only regret that it should be necessary to direct attention to the fact of the mere illegality of a commitment under such circumstances. The illegality sinks into insignificance in comparison with the injustice and the moral wrong of sentencing a girl to prison for attempting to sell combs in the street. Reynolds's newspaper, meanwhile, was incandescent at the treatment meted out to the girl. Shame, shame upon the laws that sanctioned such an infamy, and shame upon the magistrate who administered them with a cold-blooded heartlessness worthy of the old Bailey hangman. Because Mary Donovan was poor, helpless and friendless, the rude and insolent chief magistrate of London thought he could gratuitously and unfeelingly insult her. What right had he to infer that comb-selling was a mask for prostitution? How dare he sneer at and libel the humble vocation of the poor creature who is probably more virtuous than half the crinolined, jewel-bedizened dames that dine and dance at Mansion House festivities? As newspaper condemnation of the Lord Mayor gathered momentum, readers began sending money to the Mansion House, insisting that it be given to Mary Donovan on her release from prison. Stung by the barrage of criticism, Wyer attempted to justify his action at the conclusion of court business on Wednesday the 23rd of March by publicly trashing the reputation of the girl whose good name he had impugned just a few days before. I do not know whether I am right in what I am going to say, he told the court, because I think a magistrate is not bound to enter upon a defence of anything which he may do in his judicial capacity. But in the case of Mary Donovan, I have received a great many letters, some of them containing small contributions for her use, and others filled with the most violent and scurrilous abuse. It is well known that the girl had been here before, he asserted, and that she and those with whom she associates have long been in the habit of assembling together and annoying the passers-by with the most disgusting language. And, in fact, she showed how vile was the language she could use while in this house awaiting her examination, and altogether her conduct has not been such as to excite sympathy, for she is not quite so pure as she wanted to appear. If she had gone away from the place when the officer requested her to do so, she would not have been brought before me. But instead of doing so, she resisted the officer and tried to excite public sympathy and collected a great crowd around her to the public inconvenience. I know it is quite impossible, in a police report, condensed as it necessarily is, to give all the facts of such a case, and therefore I have no fault at all to find with the accuracy of the report, and am willing to take upon myself all the responsibility of the case. 
but it is, I must say, something new to me after 30 years of devotion to the principles of justice and humanity and of a desire to rescue such girls as Mary Donovan from a life of misery and vice to be accused of all sorts of crimes against justice and even, I may say, against common humanity, and if it had not been for the contributions, I should have thought it altogether unnecessary to offer any remarks upon the case. He had, he stated, had the girl's background investigated, and had discovered that. Some years ago, this girl was placed in King Edward's School of Industry and Refuge for Girls in Albert Street, Spitalfields, and extraordinary results were anticipated from her evident natural abilities. But after two years of training for a pupil teacher, with a view of opening up to her a respectable and useful mode of livelihood, they were compelled to dismiss her for disorderly conduct, and since then she has been living in Flower and Dean Street, Spitalfields, a locality chosen rather by those of most irregular habits than by girls who desire to get an honourable and an honest living. I must add that the contributions usually sent to this court are for the benefit, generally, of the poor and deserving, and not for the criminal. This girl has been to prison before. She had been long under the notice of the police, and was the ringleader of a gang of girls who have long been complained of by the inhabitants for their habit of collecting around the Royal Exchange and the Fenchurch Street Railway Station for the purpose of importuning gentlemen for money and abusing those who gave them nothing, and there is strong reason for suspicion that the combs and other articles which these girls carry, and ostensibly for sale, are carried about not to sell, but merely as a cover to enable them to address gentlemen and induce them to comply with their desires. I must add that on the very day when she was brought before me, and after the case was concluded, a gentleman came forward to complain about her conduct, but said he did not dare to do it in open court, because he felt well assured that if he did so, his windows would be broken next morning by her companions. The next day, James Cohen, the chaplain at Holloway Prison, attempted to defend the Lord Mayor by further blackening the reputation of Mary Ann Donovan. Writing to the Lord Mayor, he stated that, My Lord Mayor, so much feeling has been excited by the report of Mary Ann Donovan's case that I may be allowed to state some circumstances in her previous history. She was committed to prison in June last for 21 days for an attempt to steal a watch from a gentleman. Great efforts were made here by the female officers and by myself, as well as by some ladies visiting the prison, to persuade her to go into an institution with a view to obtaining a situation. But she pertinaciously refused every offer. In the October following, she was again committed for creating a disturbance in the street and sent here for 14 days. Again, we used every endeavour to induce her to abandon her life in the streets, but in vain. I observed that in the report of the case much stress was laid upon her indignant denial that she had ever been on the streets. Giving every credit to her statement, it is only right to inform your lordship that the officers of the prison have observed that she is evidently well acquainted with some of the worst characters in the prison who are undeniably streetwalkers of the lowest class. There can be no doubt, I think, that the combs and other articles for sale are but a pretext to cover designs of quite a different kind, and such that no young woman with such a horror of vice as Mary Ann Donovan professes, and who had the option of respectable employment, would be willing to expose herself to. If Lord Mayor Wyatt thought that his and James Cohen's character assassination of Mary Ann Donovan was going to end the press opprobrium towards him, he was very much mistaken. The statement made by the Lord Mayor on Wednesday, a pined Reynolds's newspaper, on Sunday the 27th of March, aggravates rather than extenuates his previous conduct. He alleged that Mary Donovan is not so pure as she wished to appear to be, but Mr. Wyer, as a magistrate and as a lawyer, must know that such an imputation on the chastity of a female, unsupported by corroborative evidence, constitutes a wicked and malicious libel. Such evidence he did not, and therefore we may fairly presume could not produce, although a whole army of policemen and detectives is at his back to ferret out the antecedents of the poor Irish girl. The Lord Mayor has no more right to defame the character by questioning the chastity of the poorly clad comb seller than to sully the reputation of the first duchess in the land. 
Mind you, it is also worth noting that the Lord Mayor was not without his supporters. On Friday the 25th of March, a correspondent who signed himself another working man wrote to the Daily News, If your correspondent, a working man, will take a leisure walk during his Monday's holiday through Lombard Street and round the Royal Exchange, he will probably see enough of the class represented at the Mansion House by Miss Donovan to make him regret his hasty sympathy and unseasonable indignation. Not yielding to the working man induced sympathy with the distressed, I have yet to learn that it is properly bestowed in encouraging the bands of sturdy vagrants which now infest our streets and loiter about our public buildings. A very hasty inspection will suffice to discover that they thrive well enough, physically, upon their lazy calling. The press criticism of Lord Mayor Wyre rumbled on throughout April as more and more people sided with Mary Ann Donovan. Her solicitors, Messrs Tucker and New, began delving into the accusations made against her by the Lord Mayor, the Reverend James Cohen, and the police, and their inquiries revealed that several of them were provably untrue. They therefore instructed Barrister Mr MacDonnell to approach the Lord Mayor in order to set the record straight, and he duly appeared before David Williams Wyer in the Justice Chamber at the Mansion House on Saturday the 23rd of April. However, the Chief Magistrate of the City of London was in no mood to concede that he may have been wrong. As the barrister began addressing the court, the Lord Mayor interrupted him. "'What is the nature of your application? To ask your Lordship to receive the evidence of several most respectable persons, amongst whom is a Magistrate of the County and former Sheriff of London, to show that the imputation made in this court upon the moral character of a person who was lately tried before your Lordship I shall hear no application in public without first being applied to in private to see whether I shall approve of it. The case I allude to is that of Mary Ann Donovan. I peremptorily refuse to receive any application in public until I have first heard it in private. Characters of absent persons might be impugned by ex parte statements. I am here to satisfy your lordship that the character of this girl has been injured by the unsupported evidence of the policeman and the imputation made against her in this court. The Lord Mayor rose from his seat. I distinctly refuse to hear it. According to the tablet, reporting on the proceedings in its edition of Saturday the 30th of April, Mr. MacDonald, after several ineffectual efforts to convince the Lord Mayor that the application was one which ought to be heard in public, as the charge against her character had been made in public, asked his lordship when he would hear it in private. "'Any morning you like,' replied the Lord Mayor. "'Will your lordship hear me now?' asked Mr. MacDonald. "'Yes,' replied the Lord Mayor. Thereupon, the tablet reported, Mr. MacDonald, accompanied by the solicitor, adjourned to the Lord Mayor's private room and made his application in private, but, as we understand it, his lordship refused to allow it to be made in public. We are given to understand that Mr. MacDonald was prepared with the evidence of the mother of the girl, supported by that of a clergyman, and also of the landlord of the house where the mother and the girl herself have resided for the last 18 months, which would have proved that the girl had never resided in Flower and Dean Street, as stated by the Lord Mayor, and that she was perfectly virtuous. The newspaper also reported that We understand that the institutions which the girl refused to go to were for the reformation of abandoned females, and the ground of her refusal was that she would thereby be admitting the charges against her. The fact that the Lord Mayor had been unwilling to back down and publicly clear Mary Ann Donovan's name reignited the newspaper criticism of him. As the tablet opined, we cannot understand how any man, having it in his power to make reparation for an unjust judgment, could refuse a poor girl whom he had injured an opportunity of showing him that the reflections he had cast upon her repute were slanderous and untrue. We doubt if there is another magistrate upon the bench who would not gladly have accorded such an opportunity. If he had had confidence in the justice of his decision, he would not have objected to allow additional light to be thrown on it. That he has done so shows that he has neither the courage to submit his decision to the test of evidence, nor to do even that little which he might do to repair an injustice. 
Worse still, it had also transpired that the sums of money that the public had been sending in to the Lord Mayor for the benefit of the girl had not been put to their intended use. The Lord Mayor had forwarded the money to the Reverend James Cohen at Holloway Prison, but he had refused to use it for the benefit of Mary on the grounds that she had refused to enter an institution for abandoned women. The Right Honourable David Williams Wire was no doubt getting right honourably sick of the case that had hounded him for over a month now, and he was probably wishing that for just one day he could enjoy a respite from the attacks upon him, several of which had become very personal indeed. As the Illustrated Times put it, the Lord Mayor is not, it appears, quickly to hear the last of Mary Ann Donovan, illegally committed to jail for a fortnight for trying to sell combs. The horrible shadow of that miserable victim is still doomed to haunt him at his breakfast table from the columns of his daily journal. But gradually the case of Mary Ann Donovan began to fade from the public spotlight, and newspaper attacks on the Lord Mayor decreased, albeit references to it were still appearing in the press as late as 1862. In fairness to David Williams Wire, he seems to have been a respected and philanthropically minded man who was an enthusiastic supporter of numerous charities. It would appear that, initially at least, he acted out of a genuine desire to help Mary Ann Donovan and a sincere wish to rescue her from what he perceived as a life of vice on the streets of London. He almost certainly did not envisage the public outcry that followed his sentencing Mary to 14 days imprisonment and his attempts to blacken her character once the medium frenzy over the case erupted were, to say the least, reprehensible. Of course, by this time, Mary Ann Donovan had become a cause, not a case, and when this happened, facts became secondary to opinions as the opposing sides of the argument became entrenched in their views. Was the Lord Mayor justified in his public denouncements of Mary Ann Donovan? He almost certainly wasn't. But was she, in reality, the virtuous and hard-working poor Irish girl that her champions portrayed her to be? Probably not. According to several newspapers, on her release from prison, Mary Ann Donovan was offered a place in a training institution for servants, which she immediately accepted, thus sealing the image of her as a virtuous, hard-working girl who had been horribly maligned by the city's top official. However, she didn't pursue a career in service for very long. Indeed, Within a year, she was back selling combs on the streets of London and had soon fallen foul of the city authorities once again. Reynolds's newspaper, one of her most vociferous champions in the aftermath of her court appearance and imprisonment, published an article on Sunday the 11th of March, 1860, that cast her in a very different light to the hard-working virtuous Irish girl of the previous year. Mary Ann Donovan again. Mary Ann Donovan and Anne West, two girls well known as hawkers of combs about the precincts of the Royal Exchange, were charged with assaulting a little boy named Thomas Higgins, who had, on the previous day, been a witness against a pal of theirs, charged with pocket-picking. Higgins said, Yesterday afternoon I was standing at the mansion house, looking at the van which the prisoners were being taken away in, and a boy I had been a witness against as he was getting in kicked the policeman who was getting in after him. I said, Hello there, you're going to have a good ride and you ought to say nothing. And as soon as I had said that, the prisoner, Donovan, rushed up to me and smacked my face. I tried to defend myself, and then the other girl came up, and while Donovan kept on smacking my face, she lugged me about by the hair of my head. They tried, too, to scratch my face and hurt my finger very much. Mr. Alderman Hale asked him, Did they make those marks that are on your face now? Yes, sir, replied the boy. Constable Allen, 448, said he saw Donovan smack the boy's face several times with great violence, and as he tried to get away, she clutched him by the hair of his head. West also caught him in the same way, and the witness could not loose their hold of his hair and rescue him from their clutches without great difficulty. Then it took three officers to get Donovan to the station, and altogether she was so violent that if the police had not interfered, she would no doubt have done the boy some serious injury. It was one of the most determined assaults he had ever seen. Another policeman corroborated this statement. 
Donovan's defence was that what the officers had said was all lies and spite. The boy hit her first in the way of a lark, and she hit him in the way of a lark, till he hit her hard, and then she gave him a little bit of her fingers. But as to West, she never touched the boy at all, except to separate them. West also stuck to this tale, but Mr. Alderman Hale said the case was quite clear against both, and fined them twenty shillings each, with fourteen days' imprisonment in default. They had no money, and were accordingly locked up. Interestingly, there was no press outcry over this latest court appearance and prison sentence. Indeed, very few newspapers even bothered to cover the story. Alderman Hale, the presiding magistrate on this occasion, received no criticism, and no champions took up the cudgels to defend the honour of Mary Ann Donovan. As for David Williams Wire, he suffered a stroke shortly after leaving office in November 1859. Although he carried on working as a solicitor, and continued with his civic duties in his role as an alderman. He died suddenly at 10 a.m. on the morning of Friday the 9th of November, 1860, at his house in Lewisham, and he was buried in the family vault at West Norwood Cemetery on Friday the 16th of November. <laughs>